this presentation, we will take a look at the book of Micah. I believe it's seven chapters. As with all presentations, I would read the chapters before watching this so that you're familiar with the details and the storyline, as I will just give commentary and insights on particular things that I feel that are important. So with that in mind, by way of introduction, several prophets with books in the Old Testament are contemporaries or near contemporaries. Those would be Joel, Amos, Hosea, and Micah. Micah was called by the Lord to cry warning to Israel and Judah. As Nephi wrote, none of the house of Israel had ever been destroyed, save it were foretold them by the prophets of the Lord, 2 Nephi 25, 9. The literal fulfillment of that statement is shown in this period of Israel's history. In some ways, the message of these prophets were similar, as one would expect, but they also have differences. The great Old Testament scholar Sidney B. Sperry explained, since Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah, Hosea, and Amos, the problems he faced were much the same as theirs. Micah was not a statesman like Isaiah. Consequently, he was not so much concerned about his nation's political sins. The prophet was more like Amos in that his grievance were social in character. He was especially concerned with the attempt of the nobles to build up large estates by ejecting small property owners. Corrupt judges assisted their greedy friends in robbing the weak, widows, and orphans without means of defense, were deprived of their goods by force, and oftentimes sold into slavery. The common people were kept in bondage through high taxation, and creditors were unmerciful on their victims. Micah held the nobility to be responsible for the terrible, terrible moral and social corruption among the people. He likened the nobles to cannibals who eat the flesh of the people and chop their bones in pieces for the pot. There was no end to their greed and rapacity, and decisions were given to those who paid the largest bribes. Boy, that sounds a lot like, like 2022, doesn't it? You can see why God had these books preserved. Because if judgment came to them and their society because of these problems, and we have the same ones, then judgment will come to ours too. Social and individual corruption and greed were evidenced everywhere today. Though you are studying the writings of a man who lived over 2,500 years ago, you will find his message remarkably up to date. The scholar J.R. Dumelo points out the following social conditions. The inward changes in the social conditions of the people of Judah during this period were as great as the outward. Judah had been forced out of its isolation. Trade relations had sprung up with the neighboring peoples. The best intelligence and energy left the country for the capital, where the opportunities of advancement were greatest. Increased trade made the rich and clever richer, the poor relatively poorer. Power became centralized in Jerusalem. It was the seat of the temple, which had won a new importance through Hezekiah's reforms, the heart of the national defense against Assyria, and the chief center of the new wealth. The country districts in the city had lost touch with each other. Besides whether Judah succeeded in maintaining a precarious independence or became a vassal state to Assyria, its condition under Hezekiah required money, either to pay tribute or maintain its fortresses and army, and these charges fell specifically on the peasantry. Prophesying at the time of Isaiah, he speaks from a different standpoint. Isaiah was one of the ruling class in the capital. Micah was one of the oppressed peasantry. The vices of the city he selects are almost the same as Isaiah's scourges, as Isaiah scourges a variance, 2-2, oppression of the poor, 2-9, and luxury, chapter 2, verse 11. But Micah is especially severe on the religious leaders, 3, 5 through 11. Evidently, when Hezekiah made the temple the center of the national religion, he unintentionally made the religious teachers more dependent upon the ruling class. Isaiah predicted, however, the security of Jerusalem. God will intervene to deliver his city from Assyria. 
Micah found men misunderstanding this promise and believing that God would not destroy the city and temple no matter what they did. He told them the only reason why this city was to be preserved was that it might become the center of a better morality and purer faith. Samaria and Jerusalem, the centers of the nation, ought to be centers of justice and true religion. Instead, they were the centers of irreligion. Therefore, Samaria has fallen, chapter 1, verse 6, and Jerusalem shall fall, chapter 3, verse 12. Let's get into the book of Micah now. So let's take a look at chapter 1, Judgment on Samaria and Judah. Sargon destroyed Samaria, the capital of northern Israel, 722 or 721 B.C. Micah, about 720 B.C., declaring, verse 6, that Samaria's fall has been due to its sins, announced a like, sim, a like fate for Jerusalem, guilty of a like sin, verse 9. To the prophet, this ruin of the people is not like that of the other nations Assyria had destroyed. Since God is manifesting himself in it, Micah summons the nation to witness the advent. It's verses 2 through 4. The scourge will fall most heavily on the capitals because the sin of the people has centered there. Verse 5. Micah chapter 1 verse 4 says, And the mountains shall be molten under him, and the valleys shall be cleft, a wax before the fire, as the waters that are poured down a steep place. Uh, compare the language in Micah 1 4 with some others I've got from Isaiah and Peter, that you uh, have some similar descriptions of the destruction being described as molten and valleys being cleft in fire. Isaiah 64, 1 through 2 says, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burneth, the fire causeth the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. Second Peter 3, 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and earth also the works that are therein shall be burned up. Doctrine and Covenants 101, 22 through 20, 23 through 25. And preparation for the revelation which is to come, when the veil of the covering of my temple and my tabernacle, which hideth the earth, shall be taken off, and all flesh shall see me together. And every corruptible thing, both of man and of beast, and of the field, and of the fowls of the heavens, or of the fish of the seas that dwell upon all the face of the earth, shall be consumed. And also that of the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And all things shall become new, that my knowledge and my glory may dwell up all upon the earth. Uh, Micah 1 4, and all these others are probably talking about the similar events and times of the cleansing. Certainly the cleansing of Jerusalem and its sins will be symbolic and a type of the cleansing that will, before Christ comes of the nations that are wicked today. Doctrine and Covenants 133, 40-41 says, Call upon the name of the Lord day and night, saying, O that thou wouldest rend the heavens, and thou wouldest come down, that the mountains may flow down at thy presence, and it shall be answered upon their heads. For the presence of the Lord shall be as the melting fire that burneth, and as the fire which causeth the waters to boil. Israel ruin is to be an object lesson to the nations. God's judgment in figures taken from earthquakes, storm, and lightning. So we see Micah 1, verse 4, that um, when you sin, unfortunately, and especially when you've been given much and much is required, Israel had, had the gospel. Jerusalem had had the gospel of Judah. Their ruin now will be an object lesson to all the nations, that God will not be mocked. Micah chapter 1, verses 7 through 16, judgments on villages of Judah. Micah 7 through 9. And all the graven images thereof shall be beaten to pieces, and all the hires thereof shall be burned with fire, and all the idols thereof will I lay desolate. 
for she gathereth it of the hire of an harlot, that they shall return to the hire of an harlot. What hires in this verse means refers to those in Israel that prostitute themselves in the services of the heathen Canaanites as religious prostitutes, which Moses warned them in Deuteronomy 23, 17 through 18. Let's read that. And this is my translation, a better little translation. It says... Moses warned them, There shall be no whore, meaning female temple prostitute, of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite, meaning male temple prostitutes, of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore, the prostitute of males, meaning the money they make, or the price of a dog, meaning a prostitution by males, into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. We don't want you to pay tithing on that money. Thank you very much. For even both these are an abomination to the Lord thy God. Now here are members of the church becoming male and female prostitutes, not in the temple in Jerusalem, but to the groves and the temples of Baal. That's where they were temple prostitutes at. Members of the church are now practicing heathen rituals in the groves and temples of Baal. And Moses warned them, do not whore yourself out to the pagan gods. And so that's what Micah verse 7 is referring to. These hires, these men and women in the church who hired themselves out as prostitutes in the pagan temples to earn money. Verse 8, therefore I will wail and howl. I will go stripped and naked. I will make a wailing like the dragons, which is usually the jackals, and mourning as the owls. Stripped and naked meaning without the outer garment here used as a sign of mourning. Dragon means jackals, howls, ostriches. As a parrot, Micah laments the calamities he predicts. This is not enjoyable for him, but he must give the word of God as declared to him, they will go without outer garments. That usually is a sign of mourning. That's how desolate it will become. Verse 9, For her wound is incurable, Jerusalem, for it shall come unto Judah. I'm sorry, that's the her Judah. He is coming to the gates of my people, even to Jerusalem. The phrase her wound is incurable refers to the wickedness of the northern kingdom. The statement, it is come unto Judah, shows that the spiritual sickness had spread to the southern kingdom as well. See, by this time, the northern kingdom, Israel, has already been destroyed by Assyria and the majority of the people taken captive. Mike is now warning them, similar fate is coming to you because you have committed the same sins. Well, we today commit sins of whoredom and hiring ourselves out. I'm not just talking church, I'm talking society. That whore, people whore themselves out to make money for all different kinds of things. Well, what makes us think that similar judgments will not come today? Micah 1, verses 10 through 14, contain a series of word plays on the names of villages in southwest Judah. The word play technique is readily apparent in the Hebrew and can be appreciated in this more literal translation that I'm going to give you in Micah 1, 10 through 14. First of all, here, here, here is pretty much the King James Version. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. At Bethel, Ophrah, roll thyself in the dust. Pass ye away, O inhabitants of Saphir, in nakedness and shame. The inhabitants of Zanan is not come forth. The wailing of Bethel shall take from you the standing place thereof. For the inhabitant of Marot waxeth anxiously for good, or waiteth anxiously for good. Because evil has come down from the Lord into the gate of Jerusalem. Bind the chariots to the swift steeds, O inhabitants of Lachish. She was the beginning of sin to the daughters of Zion. For the transgression of Israel are found in thee. Therefore shalt thou give a parting gift to Morshurethgoth. The house of Aksib shall be a deceitful thing unto the kings of Israel. And so he names all these different villages and the destructions that are coming. Now, here's the word play that you don't see in the King James Version. 
tell it not and tell town. See, see what he's doing here? You're not going to get a warning. Goth is going to mean tell town. Weep not tears in tear town. Grovel in the dust at dust town. Fair for stripping, O oh fair town. Stir town, meaning Zahan, Zanan, dare not stir. The wailing of stay town will take away the stay. And Marot hopes in vain, for doom descends from the eternal to the very gates of Jerusalem. To horse and drive away, O horse, o horse town, O source of Zion's sin, where the crimes of Israel center, O maiden Zion, you must part with, Moreth of Goth, and Israel kings are ever balked at Balkton. So that's a little better seeing how he's using these word plays on the names of the towns and what's going to happen or what they'll be prevented from doing. And in Tear Town, they won't weep because they're going to be destroyed. In Dust Town, they're going to grovel in the dust. But great poet Micah. Micah chapter 2, the sins that bring ruin. Micah now enumerates the sins which must bring punishment on Judah. He invades bitterly against the rapacity of the rich towards their poor neighbors. The leaders in the capital, judges, prophets, priests alike are destitute of the religion which makes a man interpret his power as a means of helping men and so glorifying God. Instead, they regard it as a means to win money and position to themselves. The national institutions have been degraded into a means by which selfish men aggrandize themselves. Therefore, these shall not continue, and even Jerusalem shall be plowed as a field. Does that sound a little familiar? Our institutions that people relied on have now been degraded. How about our institutions of universities, of courts, the family? How they've been degraded. Some churches, religious institutions today. Chapter 2, verse 1. Woe, which means deep sorrow and suffering, will come upon those who invent iniquity and work evil in sexual immorality. That's the meaning of work evil upon their beds, a euphemism for sexual immorality. They will do this because they have the power to do so. Chapter 2, verse 2. Some will seize by force land of others to enrich themselves, oppressing the people and their inheritance. Don't we see that today? Chapter 2, verse 3. Therefore the Lord will compose against the family of Israel a misery that will not be able to remove from their necks, as that on which burdens are bound. That's why I mentioned the necks in verse 3. You will not live with uplift necks, meaning with pride and arrogance, for this is a time of calamity. Chapter 2, verse 4. When this happens, a riddle will be taken up against you, even a mournful song saying, She, Israel, will be violently destroyed, and her territory is altered and removed from her, and divided among the heathen. That will be by the Assyrians. Chapter 2, verse 5. That the oppressed oppressor, that the oppressor nobles shall have none to cast the measuring line on an allotment when the periodical redistribution of the land took place. Their line is to fail, so the nobles will finally fall. Chapter 2, verse 6. The nobles turn to Micah. Prophets have no right to meddle with social and political questions, but should leave them to the men whose business it is to deal with them. We are weary of this eternal scolding. So they make fun and mock the prophet of God and meddling in their social and political situations that have moral consequence. Boy, does that sound familiar when some of the brethren try to tell us the moral problems with some of the social and political situations 
and people mock them even in the church? Hmm. Chapter 2, verse 7. The first part of the verse probably continues the speech of the nobles. Shall it be said, O house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Are these his doings? Meaning, can we, a nation whom God called the house of Jacob, endure to hear a prophet foretell its ruin? Micah replies abruptly, your sins are blinding you. My words are good to men who bring a conscience to their appreciation. God is not wrathful and has no love for punishing, but that he is stirred up to wrath by the sins of the nation and obliged to punish. My words deal kindly with him that walks uprightly. The Lord not only makes promises to the upright, but he also grants his blessings. The reason why the Lord threatens by his prophets is therefore to be found in the unrighteousness of the people. All God's wrath means is God's use of righteous justice, righteous judgment. When people turn to wickedness, justice must come. God's punishments must follow. That's the consequences. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. It is not stated against whom the people rise up as an enemy, but according to the context, it can only be against Jehovah. This is done by robbing the peaceable travelers, the broad dress cloak that they take this away from those who pass carelessly by, as well as the widows and orphans, whereby they act with hostility towards Jehovah and excite his wrath. The wives of my people are widows whom they deprived of house and home, and indeed widows of the people of Jehovah, and whose persons Jehovah is injured. These children are fatherless orphans. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. Continuing, it is not stated against, oh, I'm sorry, that was, oh, who, uh, the, the end of that, I, I duplicated the first part. The expression forever, in verse 9, may be explained from the evident allusion to the Mosaic Law in Exodus 22-25, according to which the coat taken from the poor as a pledge was to be returned before sunset, whereas ungodly creditors retained it forever. So they were taking even the cloak that, that, that you gave to creditors as surety from the poor, but they're supposed to be given back at night so they could sleep with it and have protection. But the, the, the wealthy were even taking that and keeping that and oppressing the poor even more. Chapter 2, verse 10, they shall be driven from the land from which they had driven others. So those the rich who have gobbled up the land from the poor and taken advantage of them, they will now be driven from the land by the by Babylonians. Their guilty make the land no resting place for them. Such conduct as this must be followed by banishment from the land. The prophet having overthrown in Micah 2, 7 through 9, the objection to his threatening prophecies by pointing to the sins of the people now repeats the announcement of punishment and that in the forms of a sermon to go out of the land into captivity because the land cannot bear the defilement consequence upon such abominations. Chapter 2, verse 11, such prophecies are very unwelcome to the corrupt great men because they do not want to hear the truth, but simply what flatters their wicked heart. Isn't that so true even today? They would like to have only prophets who prophesy lies to them. Tell us pleasing things. Tell us what we're doing is okay. Tell us homosexuality is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Marriage between man and man and woman and woman is just, if that's what you want to do and it makes you feel good, then there is no sin in that. See, they want pleasing things. Walking after the wind is a figure signifying what is vain or worthless. I prophesy to thee with regard to wine. The meaning is not that there will be an abundant supply of wine or that the wine will turn out well, but wine and strong drink are figures used to denote earthly blessings and sensual enjoyment. And the words referred to such promises as in Leviticus 26, 4 through 5, and then you can see the others on the screen if you want to look those up, which pro false prophets held out to the people without regard to their attitude towards God. So they were promising 
blessings of sensual enjoyment. You'll be fine. You, you can satisfy your sensual desires. It's okay. Sin a little. God will beat you a few stripes. It'll all be fine. That's what they were doing. Well, that's what we're doing today. He shall ever be the prophet of this people, it says in verse 11. Meaning those pleasing prophets who teach pleasing things. This is reminiscent of Helaman 12, 27 through 30. Listen to what Helaman said, kind of concerning the same attitude that we want to be able to take pleasure in sin. We want prophets to tell us that, that that's going to be okay, that you're still good people. Here's what Helaman said. But behold, if a man shall come among you and shall say, Do this, and there is no iniquity, do that, and you shall not suffer. Yea, he will say, Walk after the pride of your own hearts. Yea, walk after the pride of your eyes, and do whatsoever your heart desireth. Okay, follow your appetites and passions. It's okay if you lust after a man and you're a man, or a woman after a woman, or you have feelings and change your sex, or you think you can. I'm not sure how that works out. And if a man shall come among you and say this, ye shall receive him and say that he is a prophet. Yea, you will lift him up, and you will give him of your substance. You will give him of your gold and of your silver, and you will clothe him with costly apparel. And because he speaketh flouting words unto you, and he saith that all is well, then you shall find no fault in him. It's okay. You can decide what gender you are. It doesn't matter what marriage is. It's not... Look, you can fall off love who you want, and it's fine. There's no sin in that. O oh, ye wicked and ye perverse generation, ye hardened and ye stiff-necked people, how long will ye suppose that the Lord will suffer you? Yea, how long will you suffer yourselves to be led by foolish and blind guides? Yea, how long will you choose darkness rather than light? That's what Michael was saying. Behold, yea, behold, the anger of the Lord is kindled against you. Behold, he hath cursed the land because of your iniquity. And so our society and our nations will be too. Chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. After he castigated the false prophets for telling the people all is well, Micah prophesied salvation. This prophecy concerns a people who had been scourged because of iniquity, and only a remnant remained of the once mighty house of Israel. Micah foretold a miraculous growth as the people were gathered. He used the illustration of the sheep-rich area of Bozrah to illustrate how the people will become mighty. He compared their scattered condition to a form of imprisonment and foretold a Savior and Redeemer who would break the prison walls and lead the people to the promised land. He's probably now talking millennial and latter days in the gathering and how one day, one day, Israel would be, would, would be saved. Micah chapter 3, Wickedness in High Places. Micah chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Micah, referring to the iniquity that lay before him, spoke to the heads of Jacob. That's verse 1. Or the current rulers of the house of Israel. He accused them of hating good and loving evil. And he likened them and their use of administrative powers to a group of cannibals who eat the flesh and break the bones of their own people. Micah 3, 2-3. Three, three. Vivid imagery that seared in its condemnation of their wickedness. Micah 3, verses 4 through 12, prophets who make my people error. Continually encountered throughout the Old Testament are true and false prophets. The true prophets speak the word of God. The false prophets speak the pleasant but often untrue things that people like to hear. The great Old Testament scholar Sidney B. Sperry wrote, It seems that in the generation of Amos and Micah, the leaders of Israel, tyrants would be a better name, use professional prophets and seers to cloak their misdeeds. Religion, unfortunately, lends itself to rather its cloak very easily to the uses of the hypocrite. 
So the rich and unscrupulous leaders of Israel found it is easy for a price to hire professional religionists to cover their actions by flattery and falsehood. The hireling prophet depended upon his rich clients for a living. He could not, therefore, be independent in his thinking and in his judgment. He was high-pressured into siding with the rich and consequently shut his eyes to the real conditions among the people. Naturally, he could not attack the sins of the day that made it possible for his clients to exploit Israel's common people. And we see that today. Those who are paid to say, that all is well in Zion, all is well in our society. It doesn't matter who you marry. It doesn't matter who you have sex with. It doesn't even matter what gender you think you're born with. You can change all that. You can do whatever you feel feels right. And all is well. Micah 3, verses 4 through 12, prophets who make them to error continued. Micah, a true prophet of God, did not speak pleasant words to Israel when evil was to be denounced. He accused the heads of the country as judging for reward the priest or religious leaders, or of teaching for hire, and the prophets of divining or prophesying for money. Verse 11. Using these false religions allowed the leaders to rationalize, to think that they were relying on the Lord, and to say, Is not the Lord among us? No evil looking upon us. That's verse 11 also. Look, we're fine. There's no evil among us. These prophets are saying so. Oh, you can find many in society today, even within the church. The certain ideologies and teachings concerning marriage, they're just fine. They're very natural. It will be to our destruction if we follow them. What then Micah asked would be the result when these false prophets prophesied their lies true prophets would cease throughout the land and gross apostasy would set in. What better way is there to describe this deplorable condition than to compare it to a night without vision or day without light? Verse 6. When men cry unto God, he will not hear them. Verse 4. As a result, there is no answer from God. Verse 7. Micah 4 verses 1 through 2. Harold B. Lee gave the following commentary on these verses. With the coming of the pioneers to establish the church in the tops of the mountains, our early leaders declared this to be the beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecy that out of Zion should go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. I have often wondered what the expression meant that out of Zion should go forth the law. Years ago, I met with the brethren to the Idaho Falls Temple. I went with the brethren to the Idaho Falls Temple, and I heard in that inspired prayer of the First Presidency a definition of the meaning of that term, out of the law should go forth, out of Zion should go forth the law. Note what they said. So presently now is quoting what one of the brethren said in the dedication of the temple. We thank thee that thou hast revealed to us that those who gave us our constitutional form of government were wise in the sight, and that thou didst raise them up for the very purpose of putting forth that sacred document, as revealed in Doctrine and Covenants 101. We pray that kings and rulers and the people of all nations under heaven may be persuaded of the blessings enjoyed by the people of this land by a reason of their freedom under thy guidance, and be constrained to adopt similar governments, governmental systems, thus to fulfill the ancient prophecy Isaiah and Micah, that out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And President Lee continues his talk after quoting that, The history of nations records the efforts of statesmen to adopt these basic principles as the basic basis of sound fundamental structures. I have often speculated as to the meaning of the Lord's injunction to our early leaders not only to keep his commandments, but also to assist in bringing forth his work according to his commandments with the promise that they would then be blessed. Also, they were to seek to bring forth and to establish Zion. All of this emphasized that the church was told by the Lord in another revelation. He said, For if you will that I give unto you a place in the celestial world, you must prepare yourselves by doing the things which I have commanded you and required of you. 
you will note that this it was not merely good was not merely enough to be good. All must also be willing to bring forth this work and bring forth and establish Zion. This meant to work and labor with all one's might, mind, and strength if he would obtain a place in the celestial world. Many people, so these prophets said, would say, Show forth, show me your path that you may walk in your way. And so the law going forth out of Zion, he equates to the constitution that this great land has. Micah chapter 4 verses 8 through 13, If Jerusalem is overthrown and her people scattered, how will she then be great? Micah used the figure of travail or childbirth to illustrate that Judah would bring upon herself the pain out of which would eventually come a new life in the Lord. Shortly, she would be driven from her city and find herself a captive of Babylon. This prophecy is amazing because Assyria was mistress of the world in Micah's day, Babylon being only a province of Assyria. This part of Micah's vision projected nearly 130 years into the future, but time is nothing to a prophet. Then looking several millennia into the future, Micah saw Israel return in the strength of God. Using the symbol of horns like iron and hooves like brass, he predicted that Israel would trample her enemies as easily as an ox threshes grain, which will happen in the last days as we gather Israel, and certainly into the millennium. So you have a great prophet. During his time of prophesying, Assyria is the great nation, not Babylon. And he prophesies that Babylon will overthrow Jerusalem and Judah 130 years into the future. And then he prophesies thousands of years in the future that one day Israel will be gathered and become a mighty nation. This passage has great significance for Latter-day Saints because Jesus referred to it when he visited the Nephites. After speaking of the gathering of Israel in the latter days, Jesus used Micah's prophecy to depict the kind of destruction that awaited the Gentiles of that period if they did not repent. See 3 Nephi 20, 17-21. Micah, let's go to chapter 5, The Birth of the Messiah. Micah 5, 1 through 4. This is one of the best known mess messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. It is, in fact, the one quoted by Matthew in the New Testament as having been fulfilled in the birth of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Ephrata is simply an additional name to distinguish the Bethlehem in Judea from another Bethlehem in the land assigned to the tribe of Zebulon. You can see that in Joshua 9:15. The prophecy was fulfilled, of course, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Ironically, this prophecy was used by some of the Jews to try to disprove that Jesus was the Messiah, not knowing that he was born in Bethlehem, but thinking he was from Nazareth. The people cited Micah to show that Jesus could not be the Messiah. Look, he's a Nazarene he's from Nazareth. You said he'd be born in Bethlehem. Look, stupid people. Do not pay attention to facts and the truth. Oh, they should have known he was born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, 5 through 15. Still looking into the far distant future, Micah prophesied of the great last battles through which Israel under Christ will at last triumph over all enemies. The great scholars Kylie, Kyle and Delich explained, I'm sorry, I spelled Delich wrong. In this relation, the Messiah is called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah 9.5 as securing peace for Israel in a higher and more perfect sense than Solomon. But in what manner? This is explained more fully, fully in what follows. Verse 1, by defending Israel against the attacks of the imperial power, verse 5 and 6, 2, by exalting it into a power able to overcome the nations, verses 7 through 9, and 3, by exterminating all the materials of war and everything of an adulterous nature, and so preventing the possibility of war, verses 10 through 15. Ashur is a type, symbol, of the nations of the world by which the people of the Lord are attacked, because in the time of the the prophet, this power was the imperial power by which Israel was endangered. 
Against this enemy, Israel will set up seven, yea, eight princes, who under the chief command of the Messiah, that is, as his subordinates, will drive it back and press victoriously it into its land. Seven is mentioned, mentioned as the number of the works proceeding from God, so that seven shepherds, that is, princes, would be quite sufficient. And this number is surpassed by the eight to express the thought that there might be even more than were required. And so he sees the great time when Israel will be gathered and have mighty power to fight against its enemies, which will be just prior to the millennium and during the millennium. When Christ appeared to the Nephites, he quoted this prophecy of Micah. You can compare 3rd Nephi 21, 12 through 21 through Micah 5, 8 through 15. To stress the power and the remnant of Jacob, which seems to refer to the return of the ten tribes, would be upon Israel as the Lord gathered them out from the nations, and by them the remnant of Jacob, the ten tribes who have come back, purify those Gentiles who would hear his word. Those who would not hear his word and oppose his work would be cut off and trodden down as a lion among a flock of sheep. So whenever you see the remnant of Jacob, the context of that seems to apply to the return of the ten tribes. Micah chapter 6, God's great controversy with Israel. Micah 6, 1 through 14, Micah having declared to the people of Israel not only the judgment that will burst upon Zion on account of its sins, but also the salvation awaiting in the future, the remnant saved and purified through the judgment now proceeds in the third and last address to point out the way of, to salvation by showing that they bring punishment upon themselves by their ingratitude and resistance to the commandments of God. And that it is only through sincere repentance that they can participate in the promised covenant mercies. In the form of a judicial contest between the Lord and his people, the prophet's the prophet holds up before the Israelites their ingratitude for the great blessings which they have received from God. That's Micah 6, 1 through 5. And teaches them that the Lord does not require just outward sacrifice to appease his wrath, but an inward change, righteousness, love, and humbly walk with God. That's Micah 6, 6 through 8. However, he must inflict severe punishment because the people practice violence, lying, and deceit instead. Micah 6, 9 through 14. Brothers and sisters, mercy only comes on the conditions of repentance. It is not unconditional. If you want mercy, then you must repent through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Micah 6, 6 through 8. The laws of God can only be summarized as Micah did in verses 6 through 8 and three words. Keep the commandments. Micah said in these verses that sin is the breaking of a divine law and that the offering of blood sacrifice could have no effect in remitting sin unless there was also a change of heart. Just offering up their lambs and cattle as offering as a blood sacrifice it did nothing if it didn't point you to Christ in his blood, and that changed your heart, a broken heart and a contrite spirit. That was the whole point of the law, to point to Christ, to keep the commandments and become like Christ. They were just going through the outward motions. They were still offering all the sacrifices the law required and priding themselves on how righteous they were. And their hearts never changed through Jesus Christ. Sidney B. Sperry said, It is true that under the law of Moses, the Lord required sacrifice and other ritual practices, but they were all symbolic of principles that were to lead people to higher and better things. But Israel's worship had become formalized, and the wickedness of the people had rendered their ritual unacceptable to God. If you just go to sacrament and partake of the sacrament, do not think of Christ and come unto him, then your it's just formalized, and it makes you unacceptable before him. It does you nothing. Micah conveyed to the people the fundamental requirements of true religion in an answer that is one of the noblest of all time. It hath been told thee, O man, what is good, and what the Lord requireth thee, 
only to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. In these few lines, Micah has summed up the essence of t the teachings of the prophets. They are coined in the same spirit as the lines of the Christ when he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the greatest first commandment. And a second is like it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Micah 6, 9 through 16, the Lord once again turns his attention to Israel's specific sins. The rich of Israel did much violence and spoke lies, Micah 6, 12. But worst of all, the statues of Omri are kept and all the works of the house of Ahab. That's in verse 16. What that means, Adam Clark, a great scholar, wrote, Omri, king of Israel, the father of Ahab, was one of the worst kings the Israelites ever had. And Ahab followed in his, wickedness, father, in his wicked father's steps. The statutes of those kings were the very grossest idolatry. Jezebel, wife of the later and daughter of Ithbal, king of Tyre, had no fellow on earth. From her Shakespearean seems to have drawn the character of Lady Macbeth, a woman like her prototype, mixed up of tigress and fiend without addition. Omri, Ahab, and Jezebel were the models followed by the Israelites in the days of this prophet. The gross wickedness the king of Omri and his son Ahab committed and, caused Israel, and, and led to the great sins of Israel was committed. There are few chapters in the prophets or in the Bible superior to this for genuine worth and importance. The structure is as elegant as it is impressive, and it is very worthy of the Spirit of God. Micah chapter 7, Confession and Contrition Bring Back Hope. Micah 7, 1 through 6, what is the meaning of the figures of speech used by Micah? The prophet Micah employed three figures to portray the gross state of Israel's wickedness. One, the picture of a solitary grape upon the vine, Micah 7, 1. Number two, a battle between a man with a net and a man without a net, verse 2. And three, the comparison of a wicked man to a briar on a northern hedge, verse 4. Here the prophet points out the small number of the upright to be found in the land. He himself seemed to be the only person who was on God's side, and he considers himself as a solitary grape which had escaped the gather general gathering. He desired to see the first ripe fruit distinguished and eminent piety, but he found nothing but a very imperfect or spurious kind of godliness. They hunt every man his brother with a net. This appears to be an allusion to the ancient mode of duel between the retirus and sec secator. The former, the retirus, had a casting net, which he endeavored to throw over the heads of his antagonist, that he might then dispatch him with his short sword. The other paired the cast, and when the retirus missed, he was obliged to run about the field to get time to set his net in, order, in the right order for another throw. While he ran, the other followed that he might dispatch him, for he should be able to recover the proper position of his net. And hence the latter was called sector, the pursuer, as the other was called retirus, or the net man. So a person throwing a net, trying to net the people, another person would stab them. Uh, probably is the illusion he's making uh, here about uh, uh, a um, <clears throat> man with a net and a man without a net. It's probably th this mode of battle where one had a net and thrown on someone, the other one's stabbing, and if he missed it, then he goes in front, that kind of thing. Micah 7, 1 through 6, what is the meaning of the figure of speech used by Micah continued? The best of them is as a briar, meaning they are useless in and of themselves and cannot be touched without wounding him that comes in contact with them. 
He alludes to the thick thorn hedges still frequent in Palestine. The final proof of social corruption is the death of men's trust in each other, as seen in 7, 5 through 6. The Savior appears to have had Micah 7, 6 in mind. For the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemy are the men of his own house. That's Micah 7, 6. And this, this is the final proof of that no, no trust, as social corruption is no trust in anybody. The Savior refers to this when he says, and the Savior has this in mind when he spoke the words of Matthew 10, 35, 36, when he said, for I am not, I, for I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. So the Savior is quoting here Micah 7, 6. Micah 7, 7 through 20. In these verses, Micah prophesied of Israel's eventual restoration as a people and of that day when Israel has learned to look unto the Lord, the God of her salvation, Micah 7, 7. Though her enemies have prevailed against her because of her wickedness, the Lord shall be her light. He will plead her cause and bring her forth to the light, verses 8 through 9. Her enemies shall see it too and be ashamed, verse 10. The walls of her city shall be rebuilt and her people shall be gathered from throughout the earth, verses 11 through 12. She shall again inhabit her land as in previous times, and shall be afraid of the Lord our God, verse 17. For it is with his people then, as he was in former days, verses 13 through 17. So Micah sees the glorious gathering of Israel again, the restoration of the house of Israel, and have become a mighty people and a light unto the people. Sperry identified Micah 7, 14, 20 as a prayer. Sidney B. Sperry. After promising Israel's restoration, Micah prays beautifully for its fulfillment. The prayer is distinguished for the poetical eval ev elevation of its style and the appropriateness of its petition. Like many other Old Testament prayers, it is prophetic in its insight. Micah ends with a doxology. He reveals in the prospect of Israel's glorious future. He revels in the prospect of Israel's glorious future and breaks out into a strain of sublime praise and admiration for the divine attributes of loving kindness, faithfulness, and compassion to be manifest by God in her deliverance. You can see the book of Micah how the sins of Jerusalem and Judah were going to meet dire consequences because of their sin of idolatry, their sin of sexual immorality, their sin of arrogance and thinking they can break the laws of God, the laws of marriage, the laws of chastity, the laws of gender, and have no consequences. And Micah is saying no consequences had come and they did the Babylonians came and destroyed them consequences will come to our society nations will gather against nations and destruction will come upon the wicked but in hope Israel will be gathered in the last days and those who gather to Israel will be spared well Thank you for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the presentation and please subscribe to the channel.